Matthew is the Director of Communications and Outreach for the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Matthew has spent three decades working with people from all walks of life to create better places for wildlife. Matthew's career began in England and took him to Kenya before his arrival in the United States some 20 years ago. He has worked for the Xerces Society since 1999, initially at the vanguard of a broad national effort to protect pollinators. But his work has gradually shifted toward community engagement, including working with gardeners and others to transform towns and cities for pollinators. Matthew is author of numerous articles and other publications, including Attracting Native Pollinators and Gardening for Butterflies. He learned gardening at his mother's side and has created and maintained wildlife gardens everywhere he has lived. So thank you, Matthew, very much for being with, here to, being with us tonight. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for that um, kind introduction. And thank you to John and everybody else um, who, who runs this, the foundation for inviting me here tonight. Um, I would really love to be in the same room as you because that's always the best way um, to give a presentation. But Zoom is a, is a fantastic and accessible way to, to achieve the same thing. So um, I, I, I have, will be sharing my screen um, in, a, in a moment or two. Um, as uh, Erica said, there will be an opportunity um, to ask questions as we go through, but Erica will be controlling that. So I, I won't know what the questions are, but I, I do have a point um, in the about halfway through um, my presentation where I, I will just stop and we'll just have some time for, for questions. And then um, at the end as well, I hope we'll have time for more questions. Um, I don't want to, you know, you don't want you to have to spend all your time sitting staring at me. So I will now put something more interesting on the screen. Um, so Bring Back the Pollinators is one of the Xerces Societies. Um, we've now become one of our, our signature campaigns for working um, with communities um, and, and particularly in um, towns and cities of, of all different sizes. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the beauties of, of pollinator conservation is it is something that everybody can, can get involved with and can um, fairly easily relate to. Before I go, go uh, into talking more about pollinators, I do want to just take a, a minute or so to, to talk about the Xerces Society. Um, we are an environmental nonprofit organization. We are based in Portland. Um, we are celebrating our 50th year this year. It was 1971 that Robert Michael Pyle, who some, some of you, many of you may know because he's um, a well-known butterfly enthusiast author, um, and he actually lives in Washington a little further down the Columbia towards the ocean from, from Vancouver. Um, but he had this idea for an organization that would be working on, on insects, um, and that, that was our origins. But we work in, by doing hands-on conservation, we work with um, farmers and park managers and all sorts of other people to create habitat on the ground. We do advocacy, um, working to change state legislation, encourage new policies for you know, reduction of pesticides, for example, or creation of more habitat. We also do research because we are a science-based organization. We try and make sure that all that we put forward, all of our um, conservation work is, is based in evidence. It's not just speculation. And so some of that, we have a network of scientists that support us, but we also do hands-on research in the field to, you know, for example, figure out the most effective way to do organic site prep on a farm, for example. And then we do education because we are now, we're an organization with 50 staff, um, but that's still a pretty small group compared to the task in, ahead of us. And so we, we like to get more and more people involved um, and doing talks like this, um, publications, books, all that different ways of getting information out are important. As I say, we're we're a staff of 50, um, but we don't work in our isolation. And, and as an organization, Xerces is much, much larger than 
the professional staff. We have more than 12,000, I think it's more than 13,000 members now in, in, in 15 or more countries around the world. We have the private foundations that support and provide funding. We have the network of scientists at universities and agencies um, in several different countries that we work with to promote conservation, but also they're the ones that keep us um, scientifically honest so that anything that we put forward is actually rooted in, in evidence um, and research. We work with um, land managers at um, federal, state and local agencies and farmers and gardeners and you know, golf course superintendents, anybody who has land can contribute. And so we like to work with those people because in the end, if we're not changing conditions on the ground, um, then we're not um, having any real impact. I'm sure as gardeners, you, you know why pollinators are important and, and why we should care about pollinators. But I'm just gonna skim through some of the reasons. Um, from the perspective of flowering plants, more than 85% of flowering plants require a pollinator, an animal, to move the pollen from, from either from one flower to another or just sometimes just within the same flower. And by doing that, they're fertilizing the flower. Um, the flower will be able to produce seed and fruits and there'll be another generation. For purely selfish reasons, we should care about um, pollinators. Uh, something in the region of one, th one in every three mouthfuls of food and drink that we consume comes as a result of an, a, a pollinator. Um, sometimes that's really, really obvious, like here in this photograph, you know, the berries, the um, uh, all sorts of different fruit, and sometimes it, it's less obvious. Um, we don't really think of carrots as being a pollinated um, vegetable but it's the, the pollination of those flowers that creates the seed that allows the farmers to grow the vegetables. And in economic terms, anything up to $27 billion of value of crops each year in the United States are thanks to a pollinating animal. Beyond the, the, the human benefits, um, wildlife of all sorts, rely upon pollinators, rely upon the plants that are there because of the pollinators, rely upon the fruits that there or the seeds that's there as a result of, of pollination. Um, and pollinators are at the center of a complex food web that sorts games, supports game birds and songbirds and, and you know, mammals as big as grizzly bears. Um, but we also have to remember that sometimes the pollinators are the food themselves. Um, something like 95% of songbirds feed their fledglings, their nestlings on insects, um, caterpillars, flies, you know, all sorts of different insects that are, are pollinators. And strangely, even grizzly bears there, um, there are places in the Rockies, I'm um, in the front range of Montana where grizzly bears actually eat uh, uh, moths. They, the moths go up high in the Rockies and then hide underneath rocks. Um, to, to avoid the worst of the weather. And then the grizzly bears go up there and they turn the rocks over and they gobble up these moths. And that's one of the important ways that they fatten up for the winter. Pollinators, they help, they, they enrich our lives. They help define our seasons. If, if you think of the springtime flowers, um, I mean, who, who doesn't go pick berries in the summer um, Jack-o'-lanterns, Halloween scares, Thanksgiving pie, all these things come thanks to a pollinator. There are many, many different animals that um, pollinate. Um, if you want to look beyond insects, there are birds that pollinate. I mean, for example, the hummingbirds in this region are, are pollinators of some plants. Elsewhere, um, in the United States, for example, there's one species of dove that helps pollinate uh, cacti in the southwest. There are also some bats that help pollinate. Um, around the world, you'll find larger animals. I think if I remember correctly, the largest pollinator in the world is actually a lemur in uh, Madagascar that weighs 10 pounds. Um, but the huge majority of pollinators are 
insects and between them they make up the most important groups uh, overall of, of pollinators and within the insects um, just looking at here from the top left going across you've got butterflies and moths a group of insects known as lepidoptera they are important pollinators um, on the top right you have a fly not all flies are pollinators but some of them are, and, and they are important pollinators. And then on the bottom left, you have beetles. Again, you may not think of beetles as being pollinators, but there are several different types of beetles that eat nectar, in some cases eat, actually eat the flowers, and in doing so, are moving the pollen around. That you can see the, the yellow patch, that tufty yellow patch on the face of that um, clarid beetle is the pollen that it's picked up and will spread around. Um, and then moving across the, to the right in the lower um, row, you've got wasps, that some of which are, are important pollinators, and bees. Um, bees are the most important single group of pollinators in the United States and in temperate climates in general. And bees have three behaviors that make them so important. One is that they actually actively collect and transport pollen. Most of these other pollinators, they're not doing that. They're going to feed on the plant. They're drinking nectar. They're, they're, sometimes they're looking for a mate or they're looking for warmth. And just by the fact that they're spending time in the flower, the pollen gets stuck to their body and then, then they move on and transfer the pollen. But bees are actively collecting and carrying pollen around. They have... Um, especially adapted parts of their body that make them very good at carrying pollen. Um, and the reason why they do this is they take the pollen, they, they take it back to um, supply their nest. They, it's important food for their offspring. And in doing this, be, um, the bees are going out and they're working one fairly limited area around their nest. Um, and so that they're going from flower to flower within a fairly limited area. Um, and that means that they're, they're in very intensely working the plants around their nest. And this third one is particularly important. Um, they have what's referred to as flower constancy. Bees are intelligent insects. They work out how to manipulate a flower to get the, the nectar effectively and also to collect pollen from that flower. And once they've figured out how to manipulate one flower, they will go to this, uh, another flower of the same species because they can do that and it makes foraging efficient for them. And this is really important because if the pollen goes to a flower of a different species, then it's not gonna pollinate. So it's really important that the bees can do this and they do it so efficiently, so intensely around their nest and so effectively by going from one flower to another of the same species. But with all of this going on, you have to remember that bees are not waking up each morning and going, wow, I have to go and pollinate. They're going to, because they want to feed their offspring. They're also drinking nectar to fuel their work along the way, but they're not, they're not consciously pollinating flowers. They're feeding themselves and feeding their family. And in doing that, um, have become very, very effective pollinators. When we, when we think of a bee and we're as, as, you know, from the youngest of ages, we're exposed to bees and images of bees and, you know, those, those, those little um, baby gymnasiums that, that newborns can lie underneath and swat at. Um, and those have little fluffy bumblebees on them. Um, and we get exposed to images of bumblebee and garden art and household furnishings and cartoons and kids' books. And it's really, it's really interesting because if you ask someone to think of a bee, um, the chances are they think of, um, you know, like a honeybee, honeycomb, large um, colonies of bees making honey, um, the caste system, queens, et cetera, et cetera. But if you ask someone to draw a bee, they probably end up with something much closer to a bumblebee, round, hairy, and striped. Um, and Honeybees are this bee that um, we kind of think of as being the stereotypical bee, but it's really not. It's not a typical bee at all. Um, apart from it, it's the only bee that you can wear uh, as, as a fashion accessory. Um, 
and and they're the only bee that lives in in such vast colonies in the temperate zones they're the only bee that has such a rigid caste structure um, it's the only bee that makes honey in any any great quantities um, they are hugely important as a crop pollinator they're really important economically for honey production but here in in north america the honeybee is not a native species. It was introduced, um, the earliest ones probably arrived in 1620s with um, colonists arriving from Europe. Um, and they have become um, profoundly important to our, our agriculture now. Um, and beekeeping industry and, and, and the honeybees, they are afflicted by diseases and pests and insecticides and nutrition problems and you know, low honey prices that make the um, business of beekeeping harder. Um, but there are still millions of hives in the United States and, and the beekeepers are able to um, reproduce uh, and, and ensure that the, the hives are, are multiplied adequately to be able to support the agricultural needs. And although Honeybees often dominate our thinking and dominate the media. And people frequently say, you know, save the endangered honeybee. The honeybee is not endangered. Um, and but where we are finding in um, real problems um, are with our native species. And many people don't realize just the, the huge diversity of native species that there are. Um, in the United States, we have just over 3,600 species of bees. In Oregon, and I apologize, I don't have figures for Washington, um, but in Oregon, we have something between 600 and 800 species of, of, of bees. And it's some, gonna be something similar for Washington, maybe slightly lower just because um, where Oregon is, Oregon shifts into um, almost into California. So there's a distinct, um, change in the vegetation that inevitably supports supports more bees. Um, so I, I would think Washington is probably in the five to 600 species. Um, in the Portland, Vancouver area, there's anything like 100 or 125 species. And in a single garden, it would not be unexpected to find 30 or 40 species. In fact, that, that figure is from my, just from me watching and keeping a record of what happens in my own garden. And I do not have a large garden. Um, I just have a small suburban yard and there have been some surveys and it looks like there's at least one, one garden that's been surveyed in um, North Portland that actually has 80 species of bees recorded in it. So once you start looking in, in gardens, you can find that you have this remarkable diversity of bees. Now, I'm not going to try and introduce you to all the bees um, because we could be here for hours and hours and hours, but I do want to just show you some photos to give you an idea of, of you know, how they vary and, and what they look like. This first one is a bumblebee. This kind of fits our image of a bee. Um, it's yellow and black. It's hairy. It looks like what we think a bee looks like. But some bees look distinctly different and I can be tiny. Um, the big bumblebee can be an inch to an inch and a quarter long. Some of the smallest of the bees are about a twelfth of an inch long, just two millimeters in length. Some bees are just incredible colors. This is um, this metallic green sweat bee, genus Agapostamon. This is a fairly common bee and this will turn up um, in, in your garden. And it's sometimes one that surprises people because they really are not expecting there to be um, you know, an emerald green bee around. Um, some bees look a bit like a bee. You know, this one is striped. It's not quite so, so yellow. Um, it's, it's hairy. But if you look at its rear leg, um, you'll see its, its rear leg is really, really hairy. Um, because although we might think of um, honeybees carrying um, pollen and, and honey as a wet lump on their back leg, most of our native bees carry their pollen dry and they just have some kind of adaptation on their body. Frequently on, on, the, on the hind leg, they'll just have a, a big patch of hairs where they pack the pollen in dry. Um, and other bees have a, a, the underside of their body is hairy. Um, and some bees are just kind of weird. This probably doesn't look like how you imagine a bee to be. 
um, you'll see this one has its front legs are very hairy. And this one's actually a male bee and it uses those, those super hairy legs. It uses them like um, blinkers uh, to, to cover the eyes of a female during mating. So I know that that's, there are other ways to, to introduce the bees, but I say I just wanted to give you a, a, a swift um, pictorial and uh, just an image to give to give you an idea that bees are not like not like honeybees. And I also want to mention that bees are not wasps, or should I say, wasps are not bees. So all the times we get people who come and say, "Oh, gee, those bees wrecked my picnic," um, probably wasn't. It was probably a, a, a yellow jacket that came around looking for its own meal. I'm going to move now into a section where I want to introduce you to the natural history of our native bees to give you an idea of um, what the, they need um, and what you can provide in your garden. Um, I will move in later um, after our first round of questions into talking more about the things you can do in a, in a garden. Um, but I, I want you to get an idea of what bees need and in a way to begin thinking a bit like a bee so that when you look around the garden, um, if, you know what, if you know what bees need, then you can begin to see what you've got um, and, and what you need to provide. The life cycle of a bee is just like the life cycle of a butterfly. You have an adult, you have an egg, you have um, the larvae um, in, in a butterfly that, that's the, the caterpillar. And then for bees, you have the pupa, which for a butterfly we call the chrysalis. And it's that same four stages. Um, for most bees, they only spend a few weeks as an adult, maybe three or four weeks as an adult. And during that time, they will make a nest, stock the nest, lay the eggs. And then for the majority of bees, that's the last they ever have, ever have interaction with their own offspring. Um, because most of these bees, the, the bee as a as an entire life cycle is about a year, but as an adult is just a few weeks. But whilst they're active as the adult um, will make a nest, she will um, have, make a series of brood cells within that nest, she'll forage for nectar and pollen, um, put the supply into the nest. And then when she's got that nectar and pollen in the nest, she lays a single egg on it and then she seals the nest. And then she, she, she moves on and she'll keep making more brood cells and, and, and additional nests. But for most bees, that's the end of any interaction she'll have with her offspring. The egg takes, will, will hatch within a few days, within a week. And then that larvae will, will eat the food. It doesn't leave the, the cell, it just eats the food that's in there. And that process will take two to three weeks. And after that time, um, you know, like a caterpillar, it goes through several um, growth stages. It, it molts several, a few, four or five times. And then at the end of that, it will, it will transform into the pupa, into the adult form. Um, and at that point, it's only a month or so old. And so it will remain in the nest for the rest of the year as that, that pupa. And then the pupa will emerge at the same time as its mother was active, the year before. Where the bees nest, roughly 70% of our native bees are ground nesting. So they will excavate a nest in the ground. Um, and if you think about that, if we have 3,600 species, that means that there are about 2,500 species of, of bees are, are, are ground nesting. Um, all they need is they need access to dirt, they need access to soil, and then they'll, they'll dig in. Um, some of the nests are only four or six inches deep. Um, some of them will be eight, 10, 12, 18, 24 inches deep. And, they, and it just depends on the species as to how complex and how extensive the nest is. The two illustrations on the right hand side there, one of them is for fairly shallow nesting, a polyester bee. And you can see that that, that female just made a, a single tunnel going down, then off that, a few brood cells. Um, and the other one is a much more complicated nest from um, one of the metallic green sweat bees that I showed you a photograph of earlier. 
And off that main shaft, there's this branching, twisted, interconnected network of tunnels. And it a, takes a lot of work to be able to dig all that out. And sometimes you, all you see from these nests are, are little holes in the ground. And sometimes you'll see a little mound because if you have to dig a lot of dirt out, you can have a mound a few inches high of excavated dirt. The other 30%, or so almost all the rest of our uh, bees are, will nest in pre-existing tunnels. Um, this will often be a beetle chewed out tunnel in an old snag, a dead tree. Sometimes it'll be um, a hole down the a, a hollow twig of a plant such as um, elderberry or, or blackberries. Um, but almost all of these bees, they need an existing tunnel. They don't dig their own tunnel. Um, and then they take this tunnel and they divide it up into a series of brood cells so that down the length, they'll make as many brood cells as they can down the length of the tunnel. Um, and depending on the species, they will use different materials. So again, I had this couple of illustrations to help explain this. The, the upper one is a, is a leaf cutter bee. And those bees will cut neatly shaped pieces of leaf from certain plants and they, they love roses, um, they love red buds, they like, um, they seem to prefer uh, plants that have um, one side is smooth and the other side is rough of the leaves. And then they stitch those together with their jaws and a bit of saliva so they're all glued together and they make this entirely in, um, in, enclosed brood cell that they put the food in, they put the egg in and then they seal it up and then they make the next the next brood cell down the tunnel there. And then the lower illustration is um, a mason bee. And you can see they don't make an entirely enclosed um, brood cells, but they divide the tunnel up using wet soil. Um, that's why they're called mason bees. And so they, they build a wall, um, they put the food in, they lay the egg, and then they build another wall to seal that brood cell and continue the cycle. Now, these two um, nesting um, styles that I've described, the ground nesting and these um, tunnel nesting, the ones that use dead trees and branches, almost all of these bees are solitary. So one female will make her own nest um, and she does all the work, she does all the construction work, all, all the food collection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so she is, is doing all of that on, on her own. Um, the other thing that, that bees need apart from those nest sites are these nesting materials, um, the leaf pieces, um, the wet soil, the resin, whatever materials that the different species need to divide up their, their tunnels. Um, this photograph shows a, a leaf cutter bee with a nicely cut piece of um, leaf that it's bringing in. And this is a relatively unusual leaf cutter bee because it actually occupies holes in the ground. Although, although I've talked about, you know, digging in, in tunnels and um, using pre-existing tunnels. There are some bees that nest in really strange places, um, crevices um, between rocks. And there are a few species that actually will um, occupy abandoned snail shells. Moving away from our solitary nesting bees, um, bumblebees are the primary group of bees that are a social bee in, in this um, country. And we have almost 50 species of bumblebees. And here in the Portland, um, Vancouver area uh, um, and west of the Cascades, we actually have quite a few species. We have more than a dozen species of bumblebees that might occur in our, in our area. Bumblebees are a, a, a solitary bee. Um, although they don't start the year as, I'm sorry, bumblebees are a social bee, but they don't start the year social. Um, each colony is started by a single female. Um, she will have overwintered and she emerges in, um, in the late winter, right around about now, we should start seeing uh, the bumblebee queens emerging. And she seeks out an existing hole, maybe an old mouse nest, a, a gap underneath tumbled down grass, and she'll found the nest herself and start it. And then the first, her first brood will hatch after a, about six weeks, and then they will be able to help her work with the foraging and build the nest and, and tend the nest. Um, and the thing that bumblebees really need are 
the best thing to do is some nice chaos, um, overgrown areas, tumble down areas, places where they can they can sneak in and, and, and find a, a, a nice, um, stable, warm, sheltered, protected cavity. And obviously the other thing that bees need, flowers. I know it, it seems probably seems a bit silly to say this, um, but different species have different flower preferences and there are some uh, bees that will only collect pollen from a single species of flower. Um, there are others um, that are less picky and so they will collect pollen from um, like a, a particular family or a certain genus of flowers. But the majority of bees are, are fairly general when they come to their, their um, foraging needs. Oh, and that's my first break. So I'd be very happy to take questions if people have questions. There are a couple that are coming in about um, the need for bare soil or compost. And then one kind mm -hmm. of accompanying question that asks if weed, weed barrier or weed cloth poses a problem to ground nesting bees. Um, sure. Um, with, with, I'll, I'll take the first one um, first and then, then I'll, I'll come back to the, the weed barrier. Um, yeah, the simplest thing, and I am going to talk more about um, what, what bees need and how you can provide this, um, but providing, making sure that bees have access to bare soil. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes, um, you know, mulching around your plants, or if you mulch all your area, then you're not going to be providing that bare soil. Um, yeah, and yes, weed barrier can be a, can be a problem because it does create... Um, you know, a physical barrier that the bees can't get through. Um, I, I, I mean, that, that, that's, that's the, the quick and easy, the short answer to those questions. And hopefully I'll, I'll actually give you more information about that um, a little later in, in my talk. Great. Um, so another question is um, about at the end of the summer, I have about 20 bumblebees that quote unquote sleep overnight on my patio. Can you describe what this behavior is? And we actually get this question in our answer clinic quite a bit about bees that look like they're sleeping. Yeah, sure. Um, well, the, the, there, what, basically what's happening is that there's two things that are happening with, with bumblebees. One of them is that in the, the late summer when the colony is its largest and at that stage as well, the colony is supporting the next generation of queens. So they're doing an awful lot of foraging and the, the bumblebees will forage all day. And so sometimes what happens is the bumblebees are just out too late at night. And as the temperatures cool down, then the bumblebees cool down and they don't have enough heat to, for, to be able to fly successfully. So they just kind of shut down and sleep where they are. Um, and the other thing is that at that stage of the year as well, the, the colony is producing male bees. And this is general for all the male bees. As I was saying, the, the females are the ones that make the nest um, and the males don't. And so when the males have emerged, they do not have a nest. And so they don't have anywhere to return to at night. So male bees in general will be sleeping outside on plants. And you see this there. And certainly you'll see bumblebees nesting, but there are, um, some longhorn bees, which are known for the males clustering at night to, to sleep. And they actually clamp their jaws onto the stem of a plant and you'll find them hanging from a plant. Um, and it, it, they, you know, they're, they're awfully cute because they're, they're, they're fluffy and hairy and, and asleep. But it's, if you're not expecting to see that, it's a rather odd sight. Okay, and then just two more that are kind of paired together. Um, we uh, had a mason bee workshop last night, and we do get a lot of people that are interested in keeping mason bees. Um, so one question is about um, our blue, H blue orchard mason bees native to this area. And we get a lot of questions about whether um, there are other parts of Oregon and Washington where there are different um, mason bees and whether we should be moving or mixing or matching and that kind of thing. And then questions about when to um, put the mason bees in their structure outside. Uh, a lot of folks have them in the garage right now. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, do, do we have native mason bees? Yes, we do. Um, the, the 
Blue Orchard B or the Orchard Mason B, Osmia lignaria, we do have a Western subspecies. Um, and there is also a, a subspecies in the East. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, they, they are native around here. Um, the, the, the one reason I mentioned that there are these two subspecies is that the Eastern one has been easier to rear. And frequently, if you're, you know, you can buy Mason bees now. Um, uh, and often it's been the Eastern subspecies that's been shipped in. Um, and along with that, there's also um, an Asian mason bee called the, the horn-faced bee um, that nests in exactly the same conditions as the native orchard mason bee, the blue, blue orchard bee. Um, and we now, and in Portland, we now have a, a growing number of these um, non-native horn-faced bees. And they have be, they are, they, they are be apparently becoming a problem because they are crowding out the native species because they are slightly more aggressive um, when it comes to claiming nest sites. Um, are there other species of native of, of um, mason bees around? Yes, there are. There are. I, I can't remember off the top of my head how many, um, but it, it's you know it's it's a few dozen potentially. Um, but they are all sorts of different sizes, and I mean the 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 orchard mason bee is one of the big mason bees, and there are other mason bees that are like half the size. And so they won't be trying to occupy the same size nest or anything because they, they would just be looking for a smaller tunnel. Um, timing for mason bees. I don't work with rearing mason bees myself. I had the books that I could look it up and I don't remember, but there is a, there is a temperature threshold. And I know that if you were to go online, you would find that threshold um, mentioned. And there is actually a really good book um, uh, from SARE, which is Sustainable Agriculture Research Education, which is part of the US Department of Ag. Um, it's called How to Rear Blue Orchard Bee as, a, uh, as an orchard pollinator, if I remember correctly. And you can download the whole book for free as a PDF. And that has a lot of information about um, rearing mason bees and knowing exactly when to, to bring them out from your, um, your garage or your fridge or wherever you keep them. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll continue. Um, the, the bit I'm moving into now is kind of the conservation side of it. I've, I've talked about diversity and why we should care um, and you know, the, the natural history. Um, and I'm gonna, gonna move into you know, what you can do and strategies and, uh, um, and, think, uh, and um, different actions that you can take in your garden and, and beyond your garden fence. Very quickly though, a, a few slides on threats. Um, bees are wildlife, they're, they're animals, so they're facing the same slew of threats as, as many other, or most else of our wildlife, including habitat loss. And sometimes habitat loss is, is really obvious. You know, things get built on, roads get, get constructed, you get new industry coming in, and you, it's really obvious that the habitat is being lost. But sometimes because we're talking about very small animals, it's very small changes and it's an equally profound loss of habitat. Um, you know, we had a question earlier about landscape fabric. This, this photo on the left here, um, that is a, a garden. It's just around the corner from my house. And there were hundreds of sweat bees nesting in the ground and the homeowner decided to put landscape fabric and a couple of inches of bark chips on the top. Um, and that was the end of that, that colony. Um, there's no nesting opportunity there any longer. There's no foraging opportunity. That's as big a loss of habitat as um, digging it up and building on it. And this pristine manicured lawn, that's another loss of habitat as far as a bee's concerned because there's, there's nothing there for it. Because we're talking about insects, pesticides are a serious um, threat to, to pollinators. Um, these jars contain dead bees. Um, these were all picked up 
about five or six years ago, well, 2013, the dates, there you go, there's the date, so it's even longer ago than I was remembering, um, seven and a half years ago now. You may remember that there was that massive bee kill in Wilsonville when um, the big box store, they had their trees treated for aphids and the trees were treated with a systemic neonicotinoid. And as a consequence, these were linden trees and linden are a huge bumblebee and, hun and, and honeybee magnet because they produce so much nectar, but the nectar was toxic and about 50,000 bumblebees died in a parking lot, um, which was tragic. Um, so we do need to think about what we're doing, what we're applying to the plants and, and how the plants are being treated. And then as well, we're now we're all grappling with climate change in all honesty. Um, how can we deal with this kind of existential threat? The, the foundation, everything we know is beginning to shift. Well, the best answer to all of those questions is habitat. If we can put in habitat that has the flowers that the pollinators need, provides the nesting opportunities that they need, is protected and clear um, and free from pesticides. And also as we're doing this, if we're putting habitat in, in as many places as we can, then uh, and, and thinking about the plants that we're putting in, we can, build resilience into our landscape so that if the climate does change and things start moving around then our habitats will survive warmer conditions um, and there will also be somewhere where um, if the wildlife is displaced that it can move um, because there are doesn't take much to provide a barrier to movement for um, pollinators particularly insects so there's an example in europe in Switzerland and the Alps, where as the temperature in the mountains have warmed up, some of the moths and other animals, uh, other insects, sorry, have moved uphill to the cooler conditions. But there's one valley where there's a town and they couldn't move through the town. So above the town, the pollinators are, are missing, but either side where they could move up the hillside they have. So if we're putting in more and more habitat and peppering our landscapes with fantastic patches of, of of, of habitat, then we can begin to address all of those problems. Before I move into to conservation, um, more specifically, I want to mention honeybees. Um, there's been a growth in backyard beekeeping and many people, when we, we talk to them or when we read stuff, they're like, I'm gonna save the bees, I'm gonna have a honeybee hive. And in all honesty, there are some good reasons for keeping honeybees, um, but bee conservation, is not a good reason for keeping honeybees. Honeybees compete directly with our native species for um, nectar and pollen. Um, and so just by having a, a hive in your backyard, you're, you're not going to be helping the, the hundreds of other species that are out there. Um, what will help and what will also help honeybees because if we have more honeybees, the honeybees need more flowers, the honeybees need more habitat too. So we should be focusing our conservation effort on providing habitat and the habitat should support the entire life cycle of the bees, the nest sites, flowers, the foraging and a pesticide free environment. It's true that natural areas are, are profoundly important and um, whether it's a huge area, acreage of prairie um, or you know, a riparian zone over the back of your, of, of your house. All those areas are important and they will support great diversity of bees and they will also provide a refuge um, and an area where bees can repopulate our, our neighborhoods. And if you look around our built areas, you'll find all sorts of different areas where bees can survive. Um, roadsides, parks, school playing fields, um, eco roofs, bioswales, power line easements, um, those scrappy corners like, you know, snags and other stuff around and, and of course our gardens. And all of these together can provide the habitat that pollinators need to thrive. I want to just mention this idea of partial habitats because um, I've said that bees need somewhere to nest and somewhere to forage, but they can fly. And so those two things don't need to be in the same 
um, a, a, a book published a while back that just illustrates that. Um, some of the bees will be nesting in the tree and foraging in the grassland. Some will be nesting in that, in that riverside levee um, and feeding in the same area or nesting there and, and feeding um, somewhere else. And so all to, if we can put the habitat in, if we can put all these little components in to our, our neighborhoods, our towns, our cities, our gardens, then we can support the, the, the bees. Um, just to give you a slightly more <laughs> realistic image of a neighborhood and give you an idea of how bees can use that neighborhood. Um, the, the little pink dots give you an indication of the, how um, one bee in that case has found a cavity to nest in, um, a hollow stem, and it can work around. It finds the fruit trees and gardens, there's the vegetable gardens, there's shrubs, um, there's the park, there's the roadside. Um, and the, the other bee, the green loop, it's a ground nesting bee. It's found its little patch of dirt in someone's yard. And then from there, it can fly out. It can occupy all these other different um, and make use of these different elements from flower gardens and rain gardens to a, um, a, a bee lawn. And of course, this diagram shows these bees living apparently in, in separate blocks, but that's not the case. The bees are overlapping and they're all milling around using the same areas. So providing nest sites for bees, one of the most important things is to keep the existing nest sites. So where you have bare ground, keep it. Where you have snags, keep them. Um, because we keep taking these things out of the landscape. People think, oh, it's an eyesore. It's ugly. It's dangerous. It's, you know, and, and on all these things, we're sanitizing and homogenizing and cleaning up our landscapes. And we need to be keeping these untidy, these chaotic elements because they support so much wildlife. I was saying that you really need to keep bare ground. So in your yard, where you have bare ground, try, try and retain it. Um, don't mulch everywhere. You know, mulch around the plants where you need to suppress weeds or um, hold in the moisture, but don't feel the need to mulch all the way to the back of your flower borders or to the, every end, because you can quite easily just leave small patches of bare ground and that'll be enough. This photograph here, you can see there's that, that rock at the top and just tucked under the edge of that, there's two or three bee nests. Um, you'll see that the central hole and then the little scattering of dirt. And the air, that, that whole area of dirt there is only about eight or nine inches from between the boulder and the concrete part at the bottom there. So they don't have to be acres of dirt or even a square yard of dirt in any one place. They just need access to the dirt. The idea of, of nesting blocks, nesting tubes, um, Thanks to the, the mason bees, you can, you can buy these and people have this idea and it's great. Um, and, but what really you have to remember, what you're doing is you're trying to, you're replacing that snag, you're replacing that um, hollow stemmed bush. Um, so wherever you can, I mean, it's always much better to be growing elder or um, raspberry or you know, some of these plants that in time will provide natural nest sites. Um, it's always better to keep the, uh, the dead trees than it is to have to endlessly be building new stuff. But you can do this and they, they do work effectively. And around here, given our range of different types of bees, um, any, anything in any hole diameter between 3 16th inch diameter and 3 8th inch diameter will suit a bee from the smallest of the yellow face bees through to the, um, the largest of, of the leaf cutter bees. Um, and try and make your holes four inches or maybe even six or, or inches, or if you can, make them deeper than that. Um, and the reason for wanting the depth is if you think back to the, when I was showing you the diagram of, of how the bees make their brood cells inside these tunnels, they start at the back and they make a brood cell and they make another one moving forward, another one and another one. And when bees are making their nest, they have the ability to control the gender of their offspring. The female bee mates soon after emerging. And after that, she, she retains the sperm in a special chamber. And if she um, fertilizes the egg as she lays it, it will become a female bee. And if she doesn't fertilize it, it will become a male bee. 
And when she's making her nest, she always finishes her nest with a few male bees. So the last, last few brood cells before the, before the end of the nest, before the entrance, will be males. And she's always going to put the males in. But if there's not much panel depth behind that, there won't be many females. So the deeper you can make the, the, that nesting tunnel, the more female bees there will be. So you will end up with, with basically with more helpful pollinators because the male bees aren't really significant pollinators. They're not foraging. Um, they're not um, supplying the nest. They're not, well, they're, they're not doing any work. They're, in a way, they kind of fit that, that, that nasty stereotype of, of guys. Um, you can also use hollow stems. Um, common reed, if you can get it, bamboo, you can buy it. Um, and when, when you have anything like that, um, you, where the, the ridges are on the stems, the stems are usually blocked. So you cut just below one of those ridges, and then you end up with a, a, a long tunnel that is um, open at one end and closed at the other. And you can tie those up with, with twine. You can shove them into an, a container, a box. This photograph here is just one of those um, cheap little birdhouses you can buy at um, craft stores to decorate. We, we were given it and never decorated it. So in the end, I, I pulled the front off and shoved a bunch of stems in to make a little bee nest. And these really do work. Um, fairly quickly bees will find them and they'll occupy them and you can see when the um, nests have been being filled because the bees seal them off um, and you have a hint of what type of bee is in there by how it's sealed. The bottom photograph shows a, 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 a orchard mason bee um, and you can see that it's closed off its, its bamboo stems there with, with dirt. The upper one is a, um, a type of uh, leaf cutter bee, but in this one it uses um, chewed up, pulped up um, leaf pieces to seal off its nest. When we come to bumblebees, remember they, they are social, so they need a larger cavity and you can make nice little bumblebee nests. Um, they, they can be a fun project, um, but they're actually of limited value. Um, the best evidence suggests that one in four or maybe one in five of, of, of bumblebee, artificial bumblebee nests are ever really occupied. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do them, but you should just expect that they may not get, um, may not get occupied um, and it can be quite a lot of effort. Um, there's no there's no hard and fast rule on how to do this or dimensions. This example was made out of um, a three quarter inch board. Um, the, the central box is about eight inches wide and six inches high. There's a little bit of, um, that's upholsterer's cotton, um, a little bit of nesting material in there and um, a three quarter inch plastic pipe as, a, as an entrance tunnel. Um, and then, then you can make this, it's ideal to bury it into the ground or at least to have the um, entrance tunnel in the ground. This example, it was just pushed underneath a, a, a bush. And that may have been a, the reason why it was never occupied because the bees may, may have preferred a, um, a tunnel that, that comes out of the ground and not one that goes in horizontally. And so they're great projects. Um, and if you have a workshop and you like, like making things, go for it. But just be aware that they're not, not, not occupied so much. Um, and really your best thing is to have untidy areas. Again, that chaos, that long grass, um, somewhere where, where the bumblebees can, can sneak in and maybe mice will be nesting and they can occupy the, um, the old mouse holes. And in the same way that bees will occupy um, nests intended for other things, you will also get other occupants in your, in your bee nest and whether it's a block or uh, um, providing for bare ground, there are lots of other things that will move in. These two examples are both wasps. They're both solitary wasps. Um, they're both great pest control for your garden. The one um, on the right is this stunningly beautiful golden colored wasp called the, the great golden digger wasp. And it um, collects tree crickets as its preferred food for its offspring. Um, and the one on the, the, on the left there is a grass carrier wasp and it, it seals up its nest with these long pieces of grass. 
Um, forage patches, obviously bees need flowers, um, as with nest sites, wherever you have flowers, try and retain them wherever you can create new patches. And it's worth remembering that locally native plants are better for our local native bees. There are lots of things to think about and consider when choosing plants. Um, the color of the plant will um, affect whether bees are attracted because no, no surprise, um, I mean, a flower it has color because it wants to attract a pollinator and bees have really good vision um, and they don't really see red. So red flowers are not very good for bees. Um, they like white, they like yellow, they like um, purple. Um, those, those are colors that are great for bees. Um, they, they don't really see red, but and you might be wondering why this bee apparently is sitting in the middle of a, middle of a red flower because bees can see ultraviolet. They see a, a um, light that we don't see. And many flowers have incredible ultraviolet reflectance, including this, this blanket flower. Um, and the blanket flower also is shaped, its color patterns are shaped to help guide the bees in to where they'll find the nectar and pollen. The diversity of flowers is, is important. It, basically, the more diverse your flowers in terms of, of shape and color and species, the greater diversity of bees you'll be able to support in your yard. The bloom period is because you want to try and have flowers blooming from from when the bees first arrive, um, first emerge in the year through to when they stop being active. And bees are beginning to emerge. There are bumblebees, there are mining bees beginning to emerge now. And so the early flowering species are, are important for supporting that. Um, and then bees will remain active all the way through the spring, summer and into the early fall. Um, and so you want to try and provide bloom through that entire period and a few different species of flowers um, through, the, through every period. As I mentioned already, native species are better for our, our native bees. It's just a process of co-evolution. The flowers and the bees have evolved alongside each other so that the bees can effectively get the food they need and the flowers um, achieve the pollination. Drought tolerance. Um, as we're thinking more about sustainability and the possibility of changing climate, we're, we're encouraging people to think about um, making sure that the plants they plant will be able to survive in warming conditions um, and won't need to rely upon extensive irrigation. Um, because if, if, if we run out of water, one of the first things that's likely to happen is that, um, that you won't be able to water your yard. I mean, in, in Britain, for example, almost every summer there are hose pipe bans and people are unable to water there and irrigate their gardens. And if we start having problems with, with water supply as our snowpack goes down or it melts more quickly and we don't have the water storage, then the chances are that um, garden watering is gonna be one of the first things that's gonna go. So think about whether your plants are gonna survive in drier conditions and whether they, they will be able to do without less water. And landscape context, I'm going to move on and show you the slide that you've already seen, because this is, this is the essence of landscape context. There are all these little patches of habitat around the landscape, whether it's your garden or the park or the creek side, and each of those have elements of, of habitat in them, whether that's a snag or the early flowering willows that are so important for, for the bumblebees and mining bees or the nest sites or whatever. And so if you look around your neighborhood and see what there is, and then you look at your garden and see what you've got, and you may find um, that, you know, there are a big patch of flowering willows, a, you know, a few houses away or a couple of blocks away. Um, and that will support the bees early in the year, but maybe then there's no, no bloom after that. So maybe you can look and say, wow, you know, I know that that early season is, is provided for there. This is what I, know. there's this, this shortage of bloom through April and May, for example. And you can focus on providing bloom so that together your entire neighborhood will support the bees. And one thing I realized that I haven't mentioned is how far bees can fly. Um, the 
how far a bee can fly is very dependent upon the size of the bee. And basically the smaller the bee, the less far it flies. The bigger the bee, the further it flies. Um, mason bees, for example, the, the, the orchard mason bees, they can fly maybe a hundred yards. So that's, you know, a, 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 a couple of city blocks maybe. But other species will only fly 50 feet. And so you're trying to provide as much of that habitat within um, an area that they can reach. I'm just going to scamper through. Um, this is just an example of the kind of native flowers that you might be growing through the year from on the left, the, the, the late winter, the willows on the lower part. Um, uh, the, that's golden current, but also there's the red flowering current. That's another um, late winter, early spring plant moving into the body of spring. And you have plants like um, steeple brush, uh, hard hack, and above that, um, the lupins. Lupins are fantastic bumblebee plant, for example. You move into the summer and there's a lot more bloom available and a, a greater diversity. Um, the, the example on the top there is um, pearly everlasting which is a, a, a really great nectar rich plant. And then on the right hand side, you have the late season asters are the classic late, late season flower. Uh, below that is one called Biden's, um, which is a, a wetland plant. So there are plants that you can grow in dry and wet conditions. And the one that I skipped in the, in the lower middle there, the thistles. Native thistles are incredible, um, sources of nectar. And if, if you like monarchs, for example, native thistles are one of the major plants that sustains the fall migration for monarchs. And so if you can get, if you can get native thistles, they're wonderful to grow. Um, and I know that most people think of thistles as being a, a weed and certainly the, the bull thistle and the Canada thistle are terrible weeds. And I wouldn't encourage you planting those, um, but they're also not native. Um, our, our native thistles are totally different and much less aggressive and remarkably beautiful plants. Um, garden plants, i.e. non-native plants, some of them are, are, are really good for pollinators um, and there is definitely a place for them in, in a garden. Um, gardens we have for all sorts of different reasons from, um, you know, somewhere to hang out with a cup of tea, to somewhere to entertain your friends, somewhere to see your grandkids. Um, and so you don't have to be a purist and native only in, in a garden. Um, but there are some plants that are better. And on, on the whole, it's been established that what are referred to as near native. So you know, plants that are not native to a local area, but are native not too far away. Um, would, uh, would, would be better. So in this example, I have the purple cone flower, which is native to the east of the United States, um, but not here on the west. Um, and then the one below is French lavender, which I've discovered is an incredible bumblebee plant. And it fills that gap um, through April and into May um, as an incredible um, nectar source supporting our, my bumblebees. Cultivars, some plants now have, have been um, bred um, and that there's like multiple petals, extra petals, particular colors, um, pest resistance, whatever. There are even now you can even get cultivars that are uh, pollen free. Um, and so it is worth when you're looking for plants to think about which type of plant you're buying. Um, and if you're buying, um, you know, what are referred to as garden plants, so not native plants, go for older varieties and cultivars because frequently those are, they, they just support more, they, they provide more nectar, they have more pollen. Um, double flowered varieties, i.e. those that have many, many more petals than the naturally occurring form, often they, they produce no pollen at all because all the pollen producing structures have been converted to petals in the process of, of crossbreeding and um, hybridization. And then the other thing in, law, in, in gardens is the lawn. Um, again, we have this, you know, like an American obsession with trying to achieve perfection. Um, but you can, you don't have to do that. Um, you can, you don't have to 
grow a meadow, but you can grow a meadow and with native plants if you want, but you can also just allow the, the weeds to grow up in your, in your lawn. Um, like there are various species of clover, there's self-heal, there's um, birds for trefoil, all these little plants that will very happily live underneath the mower um, and will also provide more in the way of um, resources for, for bees. And it doesn't have to be a conscious effort to plant. You just have to consciously not treat with weed killers and so on. Um, well, I sometimes refer to it as benign neglect because it's not really neglect because you are tending and caring for it, but it doesn't end up looking. I mean, it's a, the sort of garden that you'll get the um, chem lawn companies come around and leave door hangers on your door, telling you that they've done an assessment of your lawn and they can solve all your weed problems. But it's not a weed, it's now a pollinator plant. I want to spend um, a couple of minutes talking about pesticides. I'm not going to go into this really deeply because we could have spent all, all evening talking about pesticides. Um, basically, if you want to pollinate a garden, avoid using pesticides. Um, they're not good for pollinators. They, they, as you heard from that example from, from Wilsonville, they will make the plant dangerous. To the, to the pollinators um, and you will be counteracting or countering what you're trying to achieve by, by creating an attractive area to attract pollinators in. If you start using um, pesticides, you're going to make it dangerous to the, to the insects you're, you're encouraging. There may well be specific pests or problems that you want to control. And I know there are some areas of the, the country where you know, the lantern fly has got established and not far from where I live here in, um, there's now Japanese beetle that's getting established. And so there are times where you may actually have a targeted pest and you may, you know, pesticide may be the only, the only um, possible solution. And if you have to use them, minimize their use, read the guidance really carefully. Um, but unfortunately, even the, what's sometimes referred to as the B label on pesticides doesn't really cater to the needs or account for the, the needs of native bees. It's all based upon the honeybee, which as, as you now know, is not at all a typical bee. Sometimes pesticides is a displaced problem because you go to the garden center, you find a beautiful looking plant and, and you pick it up and you take it home. And that plant has been treated with a pesticide at the nursery where it was grown. And so you're taking this, this plant that arrives in your yard and is already potentially hazardous because it has the pesticides, the insecticides within it. Um, we do now have some resources available on our, on our website to help you figure, try and figure out what has this plant been, been treated with and is it going to be, be hazardous? Um, there are some things you can do, like it's possible when you get the plants home to water them really heavily because that helps wash, kind of sluice out, flush out some of the pesticides. Um, but it's, it's a risk um, and it's something to, to keep in mind. Um, and unfortunately, some of these, these pesticides, particularly in shrubby and woody plants, can remain within the plants for, for years, even though for some of that, uh, you know, the tail end of that time, they're not at levels that are potentially hazardous. And of course, you, if, if you're creating a pollinator habitat, a, a wonderful garden for, for pollinators, you're going to make it wonderful for all sorts of other insects. Um, lady beetles, those wasps that are sharing the nesting areas, um, those are all fantastic pest control. You know, the, uh, uh, you know your prize petunias have aphids on them, and then the surface flies turn up and eat the aphids. The, the lady beetles turn up and munch their way through the aphids. And by, by being patient, having a bit of time, you actually end up with a remarkably balanced um, garden that you just don't need to, to use pesticides in. I just want to wrap up with another, another few slides because I've talked so far about what you can do in your garden and just very quickly to go over what you can do outside of your garden there are um, you know some of this is the our bring back the pollinators campaign um, 
you can sign the pollinator protection pledge on our on our website um, and it's basically doing what what i've talked about you're growing pollinator friendly flowers you're providing nest sites you're avoiding pesticides and then you can also share the word which as master gardeners you're doing because you're you're sharing your, your gardening enthusiasm and skill and knowledge with people so you're doing that um, you can also put a sign up there are lots of different signs that declare that your garden is more than just a garden if you want to take um, pollinator conservation to a much bigger scale, you can get your whole community to participate in this. Um, and there's the Bee City USA program that is doing just that, working with local folks and park managers to make entire communities be friendly and be safe. You can do community science. So once you've created this amazing habitat in your garden, you can start taking observations of the bumblebees that are coming in. Or if you're lucky, maybe you have you might get an occasional monarch passing through. Um, and there are various um, community science programs that are that are gathering this information from um, individuals and volunteers and using it to help inform um, uh, the conservation actions and, and help build a better picture of what's happening to our pollinators. You can also, there are lots of books with this information because I know I've thrown a lot of information at you and I, I really have no expectation that you're going to remember it all. Um, these are all books that the Xerxes Society has, has produced with um, either with story publishing or uh, Timber Press. Um, and they're, they're available from, from any bookstore, wherever you, you care to buy your books. Our website also has a lot of um, fact sheets, plant lists, information about nest sites, how to create meadows. Um, we have a lot of smaller publications and a lot of um, deeper, heftier publications that, that you can download and, and read at your, at your leisure. We also have YouTube channel now, so if you want to listen to me talking again, um, you can go there and you'll, you'll find me talking about various things, but more importantly, you also find uh, we have an amazingly knowledgeable, talented staff, um, and there are lot, now lots of um, short videos, but also webinars uh, um, that are now there if you, want, if you have the time to sit through and listen. You can also connect with us um, on social media. We push out information, we share information about new resources, we try and encourage conversations and discussion, and we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, just closing, I mean, we are a, 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 a donor-supported nonprofit. If you would like, if you feel motivated to support us, you can go to our website, and and we'd be very grateful for that. Um, and with that, I, I've now come to the end. Um, I hope I haven't spoken for too long. Um, I'm very happy to, to stay and answer questions for as, as long as people would like. And as a, as a coder, I'd add, this is my own garden. Um, I, I do like to show people that I, I am capable of, of creating something. I'm not, I'm not just a person who's spouting talking points. Um, I've got my own hands and knees dirty and have figured out some of the stuff um, and figured out some of the best ways and effective ways to achieve things within a small space. And I was saying there's 30 or 40 species of bees in my yard. This is my yard. That's the area where I've recorded that many species. So if you have a bigger, bigger garden, I'm sure you have many more species. That's beautiful, Matthew. Um, we do have a Thank question you. about, um, can you tell us about um, putting out water sources? Do you have um, favorite tips or techniques for that? Um, yeah, um, for, for most of our bees don't need a water source. Um, water sources for bees is primarily honeybees. Um, although mason bees also, they need wet soil and so, um, you know, you can make wet soil, for example, you can dig a hole in um, somewhere in your yard, you know, six inches deep, six inches of diameter, and pour a gallon of water into it once a week, and that will, will make a nice wet soil where the, the, um, the mason bees can go in and collect. Um, as I say, really, for um, water sources, most of our um, native bees get all the moisture they need from nectar. Um, but you can make a, a water source a bit like a, like a bird bath 
Um, in fact, if you if you want, all you all you can do is you you take a bird bath and you put a few rocks into it so that there's a place where the bees can can perch if they need to drink the water. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question that says, um, as our climate warms and many of our native plants are becoming less useful in our gardens, um, how about non-natives from California and Mexico or other parts? Um, uh, are, is there evidence that our native bees might adapt to this? Um, th there probably will be bees moving in. Um, it's, it's difficult to guess what's going to happen. Um, it's not always obvious which species will, will arrive next um, or necessarily what they will do and whether they'll um, you know, outcompete for nest sites or, or flowers or whatever. Um, we do have a few non-native bees that are a little problematic. There's the hornface bee that I've mentioned. There's another one called the Woolcarda bee that's another European species that um, arrived in the Portland area a decade or so back and many people will find them in, in their gardens. Um, but when it when it comes to, I mean if it's climate change and everything's moving around, um, I, personally I don't I, I don't feel that's a problem. Um, if it's a natural movement, even if it's a natural movement for an unnatural reason, um, and everything is going to be shifting. Um, and if we do start finding Californian species here um, in Northern Oregon and Southern Washington, then we will have experienced some fairly profound changes. Um, and I suspect that it'll be more than just worrying about um, whether Californian bees are going to take over Oregonian and Washington homes. Okay, thank you. We do have a couple folks that have shared um, that uh, bumblebees seem to adore their California poppies. And we got um, a note that oregano is a, is a favorite. Do you have others that you know of that are uh, particular um, attractors? Um, sure, I mean, if for, for bumblebees, um, yeah, I mean, I, I have California poppies in, in my yard for, for bumblebees, also sweat bees love them. Um, lupins are, are great for for bumblebees. Um, there's the Spanish lavender that I've I've mentioned as well. That's a that's a really good um, uh, spring flower. And then there are various varieties of English lavender that are really rich nectar sources later in the year. Um, looking again at natives this early in the year, um, red flower and currant is a great one to have. Um, Oregon grape is another good one to have um, for bumblebees, but also mason bees and various other species. And then when you go later into the year, um, sunflowers are, are a really good source uh, or a really good flower for all sorts of different bees. Um, asters are wonderful. Um, the, there are some sages as well, and, and we've already had, had the rosemary mentioned. So and there's just a few. Um, but if you, if you go to our, our website, you, you can download regional plant lists that will, will guide you to um, some of the, the best of the local species. Great, thank you. And I think that concludes our questions. Oh, so great. Janice, did you want to close us out? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Matthew. This was uh, very well.